People do not want folks managing their money that have not lived through a financial crisis. The, the first time the market's down a few points, it's the first time they've ever seen it. That's not good. To learn from the people that have been through decades of market volatility, of economic cycles, there's, yeah, there, there is certainly an intellectual benefit there, but also a temperamental benefit. Welcome back to The Kevin Roberts Show. As you know, if you tune into this show frequently, and if you do, by the way, thank you, we often have political leaders, book authors. We do have a book author here today. But the point is, we often have people who are really focused on politics, the public square, and sort of a, a policy sense of that term. And, and we're definitely going to cover that today. But really, I have to say, today's episode is about the good life. And I'm going to explain that here in a moment with our guest and my new friend, David Bonson, who is the managing partner of a $5 billion wealth management firm, in addition to some other things that are very important in restoring and reclaiming America. All of that to say, David, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So I want to start with the good life, and then I'm going to get into your story. But every time now that I say the phrase, living the good life, an image of a friend of mine, who's, who's now a late friend, Jerry Hume, it's one of the longest serving members ever on the board of the Heritage Foundation. When I first went to meet him, as I was just starting at Heritage over two years ago, he lived in California. He said, Kevin, do you know what the most important objective of the Heritage Foundation is? And I sat there, you know, I was still experiencing the fire hose effect, taking stock of everything that Heritage did. And, I'm, and I know that this, this older gentleman's quizzing me. And I was trying to think of the right answer. And then I was just honest. And I said, Jerry, I don't know. He said, living the good life, mm. reminding Americans of what it is to live the good life. Yeah. And so I came back and reported that to our staff and it kind of became our rallying cry. And then unexpectedly when Jerry passed away last year, it really became our rallying cry as a way of not just remembering him and his service to this country and probably to some organizations that, that are dear to you as well, but also for the work that we do in the United States. And so your book, which we'll talk about full time, in a lot of ways is about living the good life. What inspired you to do this? I am a um, incorrigible political junkie, and I've tried not to be. I honestly have. If I could go to a rehab for it, I would. I was um, literally walking door to door for Reagan when he ran against Carter, and I'm not that old. I was five or six years old. I had I asked my parents for a subscription to National Review at that age, and I've I still to this day am deeply politically involved, but I'm hyper convinced that there is lower hanging fruit at people finding the good life in the subject of this book than there is in the results of a given election and, and so forth. Um, there is a sense in which I am a beneficiary of what I talk about in the book. Um, I've had some rough things happen in life. I entered adulthood without parents. My father passed away when he was 47. He was my hero. He was a Christian intellectual, absolutely brilliant man and my best friend. And he died when I was a freshman in college. And work has been the avenue throughout my adult life by which I have maintained uh, activity, usefulness, found dignity, and yes, I believe a bridge to the good life. I think the good life is certainly broader than just work, but I have a very ecumenical understanding of the good life. There's an Aristotelian context many could use. I'm very sympathetic to different traditions in the Christian faith, myself as a more reformational Protestant, um, I think that there is a sense in which the uh, idea of shalom that, that a lot would talk about, the good life, this has a context to it that cannot be separated from work because I believe that we are made in the image of God to be productive. And I think anything in public policy that takes away from that agency, that productivity is a travesty. But I especially think it's a travesty when we do it to ourselves, which is really what I think is happening to the culture now. And we'll delve into that. Yeah. And, 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 and yet, before we do that, I'll make the observation that given what some of the audience may know about your professional, not just background, but your achievements, they might find it a little striking yeah. that, not that you would believe something like that. I don't, I don't think that there's that kind of dissonance between people who have achievements in, in, in the world of business and faith or good life writ large. But to hear someone say that, as you just did, so powerfully and so succinctly might be a little striking. 
So in addition to the, the, the elements of your personal story, including the tragedy of your dad's early passing, that no doubt were formative, was no doubt formative, what, what else is your story that would allow you to say what you just did in a way that is kind of surprising? Um, I believe that I've spent most of my adult life looking at a Christian church that is largely addicted to mediocrity. And I believe that there is a sense in which uh, this is a byproduct, not uh, being despite their the theological convictions or, or ideological commitments, but because of them, that there is an escapism often embedded in, in people of faith. There is... Um, they can be easily intimidated by elites, by high producers, by a sort of meritocratic environment. And I so firmly believe that whether it be politics, but particularly arts, media, finance being my chosen, uh, my calling, um, we have an opportunity to do a lot of good in society. Um, there's inerrant goodness in these fields. And for us to relegate ourselves to the sideline, and then complain about our betters and how they're doing things I've never been real content with. And so I feel very motivated by the idea of us. Uh, it, there's talk about, always about the left having gone through the various you know, pillars, the commanding heights of, of culture and whatnot. It, this is not just that. This is not just I want us back in charge of society. I really love that idea. But I also want the waiter to feel the dignity that comes with his usefulness or her usefulness. I also want the future Broadway star who is currently a busboy to appreciate the beauty of the journey. Um, I've made it to a, a very high level on Wall Street and I live a wonderful life, but my favorite parts of my life were the journey getting at this point. It isn't being here. I actually miss those days more of the struggle and that sounds somewhat easy for you to say type of thing and I get that. But I really want people to learn to celebrate the journey. Um, Arthur Brooks used to talk about that concept of earned success. And I think that the good life context you started off our conversation talking about, there's a real Tocquevillian notion in, in strong communities in America, and we can associate good life with that. But none of that was ever separated from a Puritan work ethic and a sense in which we were just creating and building new things. Uh, I think the 2023, 2024 economy has an awful lot of DNA in it from 1776, from 1820, from the, we, we live off of that. And I fear that right now we're at risk of losing it. And then we look around us in the present tense and I know the life I could have ended up having. Um, that alienation and that people talk about the, the various deaths of despair at times. I think it's a real phenomenon. I don't think the media exaggerates it. So the data is pretty clear. But uh, we talk like work is a the problem creating it. And I think it's a solution to this problem. We'll delve into that solution. I want to hang for just a moment on your your comment about the, the jobs we have or the experiences we have along the way that maybe in the moment, while we're we are grateful for them, we perhaps spend a little too much time thinking about what's coming next yeah. rather than appreciating the the value of each of those steps toward a journey that we ought to have confidence is going to work out for me it was working at a at an outfitter an outdoor outfitter in my hometown in the gulf coast i mean almost literally amid the swamps of mm -hmm. louisiana and people thinking how are you selling high-end backpacking gear. I mean, the highest point nearby was 44 feet at the, at the <laughs> elevation the elevation of the airport. Um, the, the swamps, of course, the kayaks and canoes made sense. We sold snow skiing gear. But the point was the small business that was owned by a, a one family, uh, actually until recently, taught me almost everything I know about business. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated the job at the time, but because I knew that I wanted to do something else down the road, in hindsight, I look back and say, boy, there were some moments I wasn't grateful enough yeah. for that being part of the success that I've been able to have. And so as I've gotten older, especially working, most of the people at Heritage are far younger than I am, and sort of developing that mentor relationship, which really comes through in this book, but also I would argue for you and in, in your entire life's work, it's important for us to talk about those things. And, and all of that comment leading up to a question on behalf of many in the audience who are younger than you and me, mm. who might be looking to you, they might be tuning into this podcast just to glean some advice. Let's say that they're 25 or 30 years old 
and they're working in the political policy space, mm -hmm. whether in D.C., maybe in a state capital. They, they, they know that their career is going to evolve and perhaps they'll, they'll rise up the ranks, so to speak. What advice do you have for them about balance, about work, about appreciating where they are now? Well, one of the things I have a whole chapter in the book about is you use the word balance and, and you didn't modify it with uh, what a lot of people do, this work-life balance. Because I just read your book. So you, now, you, now you know. I'm, I'm against the idea of work-life balance. People go, come on, what are you talking about? Well, first of all, I have been married to the same woman for 23 years. We do have three kids, one of which is now in college. And so, you know, we have a long ways to go on our journey, but so far so good. And she's put up with me and, and I've worked an awful lot of hours and she actually works in the business now. We get to work two together, which is a wonderful thing. But um, that wasn't because we balanced it all. There were some days that they didn't see me. And then other times they saw me more than they probably wanted to do. And, and you figure those things out. But what I do believe, and again, this is extracted from my, my faith commitments. Um, I believe in a work rest paradigm. Um, I do believe in rest, and I believe that God created the world in a way that gave us a sort of uh, model for this. He did it with six to one and uh, commanded us to do that, and uh, that's good enough for me. The, the notion now of I uh, interview young people that uh, want to know in the first interview— um, what the work-life balance is like and, and what the gym membership amenities are and what the, uh, you know, pet insurance is and things. And I'm all for people having better benefits than maybe we grew up with. It's, it's not a, in That's my, a good thing. It, it can be, it's, it, uh, you know, I don't want to be guilty that in my day we walked through the snow kind of cliche, but there is a sense in which I think that, um, they have the ability to think about some of that stuff because of the prosperity that we have enjoyed. And we have the prosperity as a result of the work ethic. And so I don't want to bite the hand that feeds us. We need to sustain this prosperous culture. We can't do that from without a rigorous work ethic. And you can't do it with a European style um, commitment to work, 32 hour, 24 hour work weeks. And this is something to me on a policy level that I'm quite sure is coming. I think there will be great, we right now have better understandings culturally of what work ought to be like from the Department of Labor and from unions than we do from our own lived experience. So entrepreneurs would never have any idea what it means to have a 40 hour work week. Uh, farmers would have no idea what it means to have a 40 hour work week. But the idea that this is sort of a birthright um, I think is problematic. Now, look, we, we have better technology, better efficiencies. There's gains in productivity that maybe don't require quite the same grind. But, you know, we I think that's a mentality that, that I worry about. And and that is something that um, ultimately is embedded in where we are taught in school, where we go to church, uh, our own family experience. And that's really the subject of the book. What does it take to change that? Because it's pervasive, and I'd say that you know, not on behalf of, of you and me as as two middle aged cranks. Yeah, because I think I can speak for you. We have far more love for the younger generation and appreciation oh, yeah. than perhaps is is conveyed generally. But it is pervasive, yeah. and it is problematic. How do we fix it? Well, there's so much talk over the last uh, 20 years, uh, first on the kind of populist left uh, about income inequality, wealth inequality. And um, I think that a lot of the anti-meritocratic moment we're living in uh, that these days is more couched in political correctness and a sort of critical theory moment, DEI and some of these things. I think it is anti-meritocratic at its core, and that should be the nature of our rebutting because here's the problem on a declining work ethic. The top 20% aren't going to play along. They're not interested in your 32-hour work week or 40-hour work week. They will keep working 60, 70, 80. And I'm sorry, but they're going to then out-earn and out-acquire. And if people think wealth inequality and income inequality is bad now, they have no idea where it's going in a society that is 20% running with motivation and 80% deciding they're willing to sideline themselves. And it isn't really 20, 80. It's 20 at a high level, 30 that take themselves out and 50 that then ask to become a ward of the state to some degree. And I think we have just simply got to not tolerate that culturally. Um, some of my prescriptions are a little more difficult than others. Uh, I'm reasonably sympathetic to Charles Murray's idea in his book, Coming Apart, that I think we have to shame 
some people along the way. I think it's intolerable that so many people who are successful and have lived a good life, that they will not, what does he say, they don't preach what they practice. I, I think that what I am trying to do here is is preach what I practice. Um, a big thesis of the book really comes down to we've really created a ethos that work is something you do so you don't have to do it anymore. The retirement culture is a byproduct of the fact that we started living longer and that we had more money. And then Madison Avenue caught on and started marketing the idea of a 25-year vacation. And it's great that we were living longer. Life expectancy went to 60, then 70, then 80. That's a good thing. And that we had more money and you had 401ks and pensions and things that enabled it. But um, I don't like to have a 30-year-old being told that the reason I work is so that one day I won't have to do it anymore. I want them to feel that there's actually more meaning and value in their work. And then that mentorship thing you brought up before becomes so important. Uh, I myself really want the counsel of 65-year-olds. I don't want them golfing five days a week when they could spend a couple days a week helping someone like me that wants their counsel and direction. Uh, and frankly, I oftentimes want the 65 year olds advice more than the 25 year old. As much as I love the 25 year olds, I'm not sure I need them to run my business for me right now. You know what I mean? That's a byproduct though of the environment. We've sidelined some of our best talent and, and I think it's awful. There's real wisdom that the 65 year old has, yeah. which is it, actually, it, it, it's not a comment against the 25 year old. The 25 year old will have that one day too. Yeah. And it's important we surround ourselves with them. You, you open, I think this is chapter one that I'm on. Um, just read this, this sentence. In this time of severe political tribalization and cultural disunity, there may be only one belief that is generally accepted on both sides of the political and cultural divide. Many people are alienated, unhappy, and estranged from traditional sources of contentment. Yeah. Explain for the audience members who haven't yet had an opportunity to read your book, the connection between that reality and our misunderstanding about the role of work. So I borrowed a little bit from uh, Arthur Brooks' paradigm about the the good life, that generally when you find the happiest people, they have some component of faith, family, friends, I think he says community, uh, and then work. And I make the point in the book that even the secular left, I think they have a lot of policies and ideas that are not my version of family. But yeah, it's pretty hard to be popular in either Manhattan or a real conservative Bible Belt city by saying I'm anti-family. The notion of family still strikes people as civilizationally uh, 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 prerequisite to a functioning society. Even faith, although I would define it, and I know you would define it, with certain uh, commitments and specificity, there's still at least a, a, a nod to transcendence in, in most the left and right. Uh, obviously, friendships, community, that, that people believe it's a tragedy when folks are lonely and don't have friends in their life that can support them and unconditionally love them. So those three things I don't think are the major source of our disagreement here. But when you get to work, it is not merely that it's absent it's that there's an opposite view of it. I'm suggesting that we need greater careerism, greater ambition, greater pouring in to elements of our work, not just simply in a white collar corner office context, but I'm certainly not against that. I don't want middle-aged successful people to feel guilty, but a, even in blue collar work and other jobs to find that dignity and, and value. And that is not the consensus view. Uh, I think that there is a significant movement culturally uh, that bleeds into sometimes uh, even right-wing politics, but certainly left-wing politics, that what we can do to pacify that final angle is greater degree of uh, state support. Um, the universal basic income idea, uh, obviously the welfare state in general, but even right now, the most popular way which people skirt the system is just uh, fraudulent disability claims. I mean, that, that never gets discussed. Data is hard to come by. And yet there's no question that the uh, 25 to 50 year old prime working age men that we hear all the time are somewhat d disconnected from society and, and unhappy um, that we have 82% of them working, but we only have three and a half percent unemployment. That number is being turned upside down. We had 82% of 25 to 50 year old, 55 year old men not working in the depression. But the 18% who weren't, it's because they couldn't find a job. 
Now only 3% can't find a job. 15% have taken themselves off the chessboard. And that jeopardizes the good life for them. The social and cultural ramifications of that statistic, to say nothing of the economic ramifications, yeah. Yeah. are almost incalculable. Yeah. And, and I'm not given to exaggeration. I know that you aren't. It's actually, it, it's hard to, to state w without sounding like you're exaggerating the impact of that because it's also multi-generational and we're only at the beginning of this yeah. in terms of that statistic being true for every socioeconomic uh, ethnic subgroup of, of men those ages. How do we fix that? Because it's, it's both a social question and then where we're going next, just so you know, is it, it's a political or really a, it's a policy question too. Yeah. Yeah. And the policy stuff gets a little bit more interesting. I'll start though by saying um, nobody seems all that concerned with the declining employment and labor participation in the 16 to 25 year old. And I'm not sure that we can separate that. Um, I don't know about you. I know you mentioned the, the store you worked at in Louisiana. Um, I was working at fast food places and movie theaters and sweeping floors and working at sandwich shops. And there wasn't like an option. If I wanted to buy my girlfriend dinner, I had to do that. My dad was not going to pay for my dates. And, and so, the, you know, the spending money thing that high school people normally go through. Um, I think very high minimum wage keeps uh, is a, a, a front on high school employment, basically. And that... Be, even beyond that policy issue, uh, the fact that so many choose not to. There's less parents that want their high school students working, even college students, uh, access to unlimited student loans. They're supplementing student debt is not just for tuition anymore. It's for living expenses, where the idea of a college student kind of studying late at night, but having a, a job they had to supplement the whole experience with, I don't think that was a terrible experience. I think it really built a certain character and resilience that was quite healthy. So the 16 to 24 year old employment needs to go higher, but it's not just merely for the pragmatic things already shared. They develop job skills. They develop the ability to have a boss who's a jerk and they know how to respond to a boss who they don't get along with. They have uh, teamwork, getting along with others. Those things are critical skills, even at higher level positions one will have later. And we've taken that sort of foundational stuff out. The other issue is more generational, and there's a lot about generational theory in the book, but with the massive amount of baby boomers now retiring, this issue I brought up of, um, we saw it, it's luckily gotten a lot better here recently, but post COVID, it really looked like a lot of 55 year olds that were economically able to retire were not coming back. More and more have come back. I have a feeling that a lot of their spouses just don't want them around that much. I, but look, you can't, you cannot take the expertise. You mentioned the, the wisdom. I think that's the right word. The expertise and experience of 55 to, I'd say 75 year olds, you know, and I understand health issues, uh, 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 certain physical limits and whatnot over time. I'm not a real big fan of 80 year olds running for president, but that's a whole separate story. You know, that at the end of the day, um, there's a difference in how it's manifested later in life. But through all generations, we have a problem of declining participation. And when you ask how we fix it, I think it's one brick at a time and it's the public policy sphere plays in, but I think it's probably third or fourth. I think it's really gonna have to start again with these stronger mediating institutions of family and church. And that's why so much of the book is targeted at the church is I, I want pastors to quit preaching about how uh, people need to quit working so hard to a bunch of people in their church that aren't working too hard and start preaching about how playing video games too hard is probably the much bigger sin, if I may proselytize such a, in such Please, a way. Please pre yeah. preach your way, my friend. <laughs> I, I, I agree entirely. It's, I was gonna talk a little bit about heritage work as a way of cueing you to talk about the work of, of some entities you're, you're a part of, thank goodness. And I'll, I'll do that, but I also wanna say that we can, we, we can attack this problem in our businesses and our organizations uh, this this problem of not understanding earned success isn't an issue inside a place like Heritage, obviously. Yeah. By that, I mean, I'm just speaking about our corporate culture, if yeah. you will. I'm not talking about the policy we work on externally, but being someone who's always benefited, sought actively the, the wisdom of older men and women, as we have hired more and more scholars here, of course, we're happy to hire scholars of any age. We have plenty of uh, junior, mid-career scholars We've really in the last year focused on hiring those who other places might say are at the end of their career. Mm. Why? 
their not just their expertise, like the the, the quote unquote skill set that they mm -hmm. have, the publishing record they they have, the influence they have for us at Capitol Hill, which of course is our our primary audience, but for their wisdom. Yeah. And I and I say this as an encouragement to business owners, to other nonprofit leaders, young people who are thinking about doing these things. The I won't say that it's night and day the, the, the impact because the the culture here at Heritage is already so strong, but the the impact has been significant, and and we feel it because it brings especially in a in a tumultuous kind of chaotic time in in our world uh, of the, our world of work of politics and policy some ballast. Yeah, like it's not that it's all going to be OK, because it may not all be OK, but we can at least understand based on the experience and wisdom from these men and women what we need to be focused on. All of that to lead to this question for you. Um, have you found in your experience that whether in your business or in the other organizations that you're part of, that that kind of mindset is something that can really encourage others to do the same, where maybe rather than turning to politics, policy, something at a at a macro level, we can actually do this from the bottom up. Well, I definitely think we can do it from the bottom up, and I frankly believe that we're going to have to. I think that there's a limited ability for this top down, particularly with with. Uh, public policy to, to drive a lot of it. On the margin, there's certain uh, elements and opportunities there. But no, I think bottom up, and I think specifically about organizations, small businesses, uh, and then uh, churches and the way in which communities get formed, I think that there's something very infectious about all of that. Um, what's interesting, I'm a little encouraged, and I don't know what your experience has been, but I generally to stereotype, think that the Gen Y was a little less interested in the mentorship from the older, uh, more experienced and seasoned folks. But Gen Z, I'm getting a totally different impression from that they're that they want the mentorship, they want the feedback, the experience, you know, myself being a, a classic Gen Xer, I turned 50 this year. Um, I promise you, people do not want folks managing their money that have not lived through a financial crisis. The, the first time the market's down a few points, it's the first time they've ever seen it. That's not good. To learn from the people that have been through decades of market volatility, of economic cycles, there's, yeah, there, there is certainly an intellectual benefit there, but also a temperamental benefit. And so um, I'm sure that's quite analogous to what you're describing, even in your experience with heritage. And I think there's an opportunity, considering Gen Z's apparent interest in that mentorship, to really bridge a lot of these things together and rethink this idea. I mean, I am I do talk bad about boomers a lot, but look, the 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 idea of getting to a point where they could go golf five days a week or drink at a retirement home all day or something, it's not good. You don't aspire to drink it at a retirement home? Uh, no, I do not. Um, it, it, it strikes me to, as one of the most depressing things I could imagine as an end-of-life uh, experience. Um, it's a heck of a way to go out. Yeah, well, and a lot are. A lot a lot are. And and I think that ultimately, that I, I think that's a pretty obvious example of an unhealthy end-of-life experience. But the notion that all you would then do is kind of walk on the beach with your wife in a commercial for Charles Schwab or or that you're just available 365 days a year as a full-time grandparent, th those things are not real life. And the ability to be a, a present grandparent, to still have a nice romantic relationship with your wife in your senior years or with your husband in your senior years, I think these things are lovely. But to couple that to some productive participation in society that's not just sitting on a church board or volunteering with a, a nonprofit once a year or whatnot, to couple it to what your actual greatest gift to society has been, your productive capacity. And the, so much of this to me, and this is where my, my world as an economist comes in, I wish we could understand that what we do in those jobs is not the selfish stuff we do and the other things are altruistic. Nobody is going to pay us anything to not be productive. If we are producing goods and services that meet the needs of humanity, that's where we get paid. And we may have a particular narrow part in that supply chain of delivery, but we're doing something that is adding value to others. And that's the beauty of a market economy. And where our work fits into that allows us to marry these passions and skills together and give sow the seeds for a good life. And and the morality of that market economy oh. is is very obvious in what you just said yeah. and and really underscores the dignity 
the true dignity that comes from work, whatever that work may be, or right. whatever the actual work is at whatever age that someone may be doing that. So that leads to this question. Uh, we It sounds like we have a very similar, if not identical worldview, which is mm. no surprise having read this book and being familiar with your work. So this is a question about the political right, something you and I care deeply about. And by that, I don't mean like the political, political right. I mean the the institutional, maybe quasi-academic policy mm -hmm. right, uh, which would include organizations like Acton, uh, National Review, Heritage, along with our politician friends. Is there an opportunity here for the political right to talk more along these lines in a way that benefits them? And if it benefits them in terms of elections, that's fine. For you and for me, that's not my primary concern, although yeah. it is a concern. But I'm talking about in ways that when recipients of this message hear this, they behave differently, not just electorally, yeah. but maybe in the decisions they're making in their daily lives. I definitely think there is. I think with Acton, it's almost an easier example because they have an explicit um, religious uh, orientation that necessarily marries together this this it's anthropology, right? This understanding of the human person. Other organizations that are thought of as more political, heritage or national review are examples. I think the great opportunity here is that um, we can provide a foundational truth behind some of the policy issues that I believe we have an awful lot of people that are sympathetic to our, our um, kind of end run, the, the policies we may advocate. They're really sympathetic without necessarily a foundational understanding as to why. When I say, we'd like to have more people hired, we'd like to have more GDP growth, we'd like to have a better economy, everyone goes, yes, yes, yes. And when I say the reason why, is dignity of mankind, is this God-given you know, um, requirement for us to be productive. Uh, that I think explaining why we want these things is a tremendous opportunity for the right, and I don't think it's always been done. I think sometimes it's been too transactional. And this is more than just, even though I fully agree with it, it's more than just the you know, politics is downstream from culture stuff. I mean, I, I fully agree with that concept, but I think I'm saying something even more particular that um, we rely on efficiency of free markets as opposed to relying on the dignity of mankind that is most protected in free markets. And I think it's a totally different argument. I agree, by the way, that markets are more efficient at allocating risk and reward and whatnot. But, but when I talk about the dignity of work, one thing that's interesting ecumenically is I quote heavily from Pope John Paul II. I noticed uh, that. And I'm a, a Protestant, but it's one of the most beautiful um, encyclicals ever written. And I quote heavily from Tim Keller, obviously a Protestant mm -hmm. pastor. So there's an ecumenical component because this is something that ought to be much like the pro-life cause. It should be a very pro, uh, uh, it should be a very um, unifying moment uh, in different traditions of Christian faith. Um, I believe that the work has dignity because I believe the worker has dignity. And I believe the worker has dignity because he, he or she was made by God. And that what that work does matters to God because the worker matters to God. And I think that um, Pope John Paul II was exactly right about that. And that's a teaching that should come from political think tanks as well when rooted to the, these right uh, foundational truths. Building off of that, what other opportunities does the political right have on these somewhat cultural, somewhat political questions? Yeah, I think that there are a lot of issues that will come up right now that are a focus of controversy on particular elements of labor law, of what can we do to help promote more employment. And, you know, there, there's legitimacy in some of these policy disagreements. I pretty much have opinions on most of them, but I don't think that everyone who feels differently than I do on some of the particulars around a minimum wage law or, or whatnot um, is necessarily working against my message of work. In fact, they may be working towards it and just, in my humble opinion, have a misguided way to get there. But where I think there is policy room is just starting with the presupposition that we want to remove the impediments to it. And this, I think, is what we're really struggling with. Uh, one of the great ways to take a declining labor participation force and make it worse is to shut down the whole economy for a couple of years and pay a lot of people to not work. Well, they did it. It's happened. And then they were just shocked. 
that there were some people that said, you know what, I kind of like staying here in my bedroom all day and developing a drug problem, an alcohol problem, an alienation problem, a video game problem, a lack of social skill problem. I mean, that, that, the, the COVID era policy mistakes were monumentally disastrous to this subject. Um, and, and so that is an example of where the policy realm comes into my message on work is sometimes what not to do. You know, they're, 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 you want to be facilitating uh, this kind of pro-work environment. And a lot of it just comes down to a society that thrives on people working, not trying to find every opportunity to keep them from doing so. And uh, of all societies, of all nations, to impose that kind of wrongheaded policy, while it would be wrong in every country, the United States would be the absolute worst because of what's in our DNA in terms of work and and dignity and productivity. Yeah. So building on that one more specific policy question before I ask you the, the final, final question, which is more of a big picture question. Although this policy specific question is important, it's about education. Mm. What needs to change? in K-12 and university education along the lines of what you propose in full time? You know, that's a wonderful question because I actually think there's low hanging fruit here and I sometimes get optimistic it's going to happen. I Sometimes. Paradoxically, um, I have a higher regard for liberal arts than uh, the universities that teach liberal arts and I have such a high regard for it that I don't need the universities to teach it because I want it done at K-12. through and the only reason we have these general ed waste of time classes at university is because they're not teaching at K through 12. So if you want better vocational and occupational training at college age, which I do, assuming that the foundational understanding of how to think and live well was done K through 12, if you want to take away the, the waste of time sociology class for a sophomore in college, then you have to teach the liberal arts, the humanities, you have to defend Western civilization. These other key re prerequisites need to be there K through 12. And if an education system gets that right in the formative years, then absolutely we could advocate for greater trade school and not make, make them go to take a sociology class or an intro to psychology class or other things that are going to ruin their mind anyways. But that's essentially, I think, the biggest problem besides the economic scam of the higher education system is that what they're being taught is so unproductive. And there's no reason for people to not start working at, at that age. They, uh, they're capable of developing the skill set. If you want to be a doctor, get into medical school. And if you want to, but you see, we can't do that because I, I look, I see MBAs all the time that are applying for jobs in finance that can't put a sentence together. They didn't learn English in, in high school. And so I, I think that the problem is really bad at the university level, but I think it's bad because it's at the K through 12 level. You know, I have to tell you, David, for what it's worth, as a, a known as a big advocate for the liberal arts, yeah. having started a K through 12 liberal arts school and run a liberal arts college where the only degree was a BA in liberal arts mm -hmm. and there were no electives, I agree with you fully. Mm. In other words, the th these... <laughs> quote unquote reactionary, but I don't mean that in a pejorative sense at all, institutions of higher learning, these colleges and universities of all denominational stripes that are committed to the liberal arts, they have to exist in the way they do because of the problem that you outline at yeah. the K through 12 level. And so if it sounds like if we had a magic wand that we could share, we would wave it over the K through 12 system and have yeah. great liberal arts education there so that when college freshmen, for example, begin if they so choose, they actually, well, they would be specializing regardless, whether it's in vocational education yeah. or in their professional advocation. Yeah. Well, I wanna ask so many more questions about that, but we'll do that next time. Okay. The, the final question, which I, I've, I've really been anticipating asking you is a question that I ask most guests. And that is in per, just inevitably in this podcast, we cover challenges and problems. The audience is used to that, but they're also used to solutions being attached to that. So thank you for, for supplying that both in your responses and in your book. But in spite of all those challenges, I presume that you woke up this morning hopeful about the American future. And I'm curious if so, why? Yeah, I wake up every morning hopeful about the American future because I believe in the American idea. And uh, so it's sort of a tautology. The idea itself is hopeful. And, and so if you believe in the idea, I believe that it can continue to sustain. I also agree with Reagan that it, uh, we can't take it for granted and we have work to do to preserve the legacy. 
But um, I do not believe in the ideas of the West and I do not believe in the ideas of our founders uh, for nostalgic reasons. I believe in them for philosophical reasons. So therefore, I have no choice but to be an optimist. I don't share the present um, uh, hyper-pessimism about the future, but I do share a real keen reality of what we're living in. And I'm not naive to the fact that I say that from a vantage point of being um, inside the club. I, uh, you know, I, I uh, am able to get the restaurant reservations I want and I live a comfortable life. And I totally understand that. But the reason why I feel a little bit more qualified to have a strong opinion here is because that's not the world I came from. I, it wasn't like I was inside the club and I stayed in the club. I was not. I, I worked into a position and believe very strongly that the things that divide us right now can be fixed. Uh, the policy errors, the cultural things, I don't expect it to happen immediately. I don't expect it to happen from one election to the next. Um, the, the education system, uh, uh, recovered theology of work. There's a lot of things to me that are going to take more time but are more impactful. But, w- but you asked the right question. I would not um, work towards it if I didn't feel optimistic about it. I don't believe in rearranging the chairs on a sinking ship. And uh, I think America's best days are still ahead, but I don't want to take for granted the work we have to do to get there. So that's why I'm going to work full time. Really well put. Thank I you. appreciate your realism and your hopefulness. Thanks. David Bonson, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. Well, folks, I told you you would enjoy the conversation. Be sure and get a copy of Full Time Work and the Meaning of Life. Hopefully over the years, we'll have David back more than once. Also, thinking about David's great closing and his response to the question about why are you hopeful about the American future, there are challenges out there. And it's okay to be realistic. But it's also okay just to keep working and plugging ahead and knowing that there is great, not only satisfaction in that, but fruit that will come from. Keep your chin up. We're going to go. The Kevin Roberts Show is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. The executive producer is Crystal Kate Bonham. The producer is Philip Reynolds. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Mark Guiney, and Tim Kennedy. For more information and to subscribe, please visit heritage.org.